Now I have two Hawk pads here. One is the Hawk Blue, which would be like a, a track only pad, more of a racing pad. This pad works well, but it is aggressive on the rotors, meaning that it wears the rotors down pretty quickly. It makes quite a bit of brake noise, and it also requires that the pad be warmed up. You gotta go out on your outlap and really warm the brakes before this pad works well. The other pad I have is what Hawk calls their HP Plus. This is a great pad for the occasional track day, the autocross day, it has good pad feel, and it's, it's ready to, to, to brake and stop and bites correctly, even when the brakes are cold. Now, anytime you go to more of a performance-oriented brake pad, that means that you are gonna hear more brake noise as you're driving around on the city streets. It's kind of a trade-off. Do you want quiet brakes, or do you want brakes that are gonna give you good stopping ability out on the racetrack and good pedal feel, and not fade on you with those high brake temperatures that you would likely see on your average track day? So before we begin on these repairs today, I want to point out that we have the factory service manual. Whenever you're doing major repairs to your vehicle, or even a small engine, having a factory service manual, or at least an aftermarket service manual, is really important to get your repairs performed correctly. Let's begin. I know I've said this before, but it's really important that there's no rust inside the hat area of the rotor. I've cleaned it out with a cookie here. I've also cleaned off rust and debris from the hat area or the hub area where it meets the hat of the rotor. The slightest bit of rust or debris here would throw off the rotor and make it wobble and give you a brake pedal pulsation or a steering wheel shimmy. This rotor is over the minimum thickness specification. I'll measure that for, it, for demonstration here in a minute. I decided to reuse these rotors because they're above the minimum thickness. Now in order to figure out what that minimum thickness is, you need to measure them with a micrometer. This one's specially tailored to measuring disc brakes because it's got a pointed anvil on the other end. Use the clutch, and if there's any grooving, try to get it in the center of the groove. I'm going to measure it in four different locations to see if there's any variance between these different spots. I come up with the same reading pretty much every time. If we look at the micrometer, I have two lines past the six, so that's 650, and then I'm at one line before the 20, so that's 650 plus 19, or 670 thousandths minus one, 669 thousandths. The minimum thickness is 630 thousandths, so I'm in the clear. Because we're going to be reusing these, we put a little bit of a non-directional surface finish on the rotors. Again, a good thing to go off of is the chamfer on the edge. I still have some chamfer here. If I had no chamfer at all, or if it was mushroomed, it'd be time to change those rotors. That's your other quick tip as far as rotor replacement. Again, a tip to keep the rotor in place so it's not flopping on you and frustrating yourself, put a lug nut on there. Get the brake accessible so it's easier to work on. I'll wipe off the surface of the rotor with brake cleaner as one of my last steps on assembly. So don't worry if your fingers touch the rotor a little bit, but try to keep any grease um, away from that rotor surface. One thing I didn't show was the cleaning I did between disassembly and reassembly. Now that we're all clean, we're ready to go back together. I'll put my caliper mounting bracket in here. I'll start both bolts by hand. 
never start your bolts with an impact gun, whether that be electric or air. Make sure that the threads are moving in nice and smoothly. Don't just leave it like that. Torque them to specification. Whenever you're done using your torque wrench and you're going to store it, make sure you take the torque off of this style of wrench. This is a click style wrench and that will keep the accuracy of your torque wrench. Before we put our brake pads in, we need to look at a few things. So here are our brake parts. I've laid them all out for us. The first thing I want to say is that always compare your new parts to your old parts. In this case, I want to make sure that the old brake pad is the same size and fitment, the one that came off the car, as the new ones I've purchased. If I like the new ones, they fit right. Make sure you check out these part numbers. I always compare the part numbers on the parts to what's on the box. Sometimes I purchase parts that were the right box, but the wrong numbers inside the box. For future reference, write these numbers down, and that will ensure you're getting the right parts in the future. All right, so we've confirmed our parts. There's a few other things I want to outline while we're here. The rubber dust seals for our caliper slides, the brake shims, these springs, even these little anti-rattle clips here. If yours are damaged or missing, you're going to end up with a brake system that doesn't work as it was originally intended. In fact, it might end up making quite a bit more brake noise when you get that car put all together. So, if that's the case, or if you're unsure about these parts, get a brake hardware kit, and that will come with these new items here, which will help ensure that you have a properly working brake job. So I put my clips in my uh, caliper mount there, and I have my parts laid out. I want to talk about the caliper slide grease that's supplied in the kit. Okay, so the grease says put a small amount, one or two grams, on the backs of the pads. And if you read the instructions from the manufacturer, Mazda in this case, they tell you the same thing they want you to put a very very small amount now why don't you want to use more well if this grease gets hot enough to liquefy it could drip down on your brake material so that's why it's a special brake grease it does have a higher melting point but we still don't want to go hog wild with it the other thing that they say to do is Put a little grease where the back body of the pad is going to touch the caliper. The idea is twofold. Not only does the grease help heat couple the brake pad to the shim, but it also helps prevent noise as the brakes rub against the rotor, they're likely to vibrate back and forth. That vibration is going to cause brake noise. Almost imagine fingernails on the surface of a chalkboard. If I put a little grease on there, that will quiet up that noise. So we've greased our pads. Be very, very careful to not get any grease on the friction surface or material. And I always take some brake cleaner and wipe those off one last time and wipe off my rotor surfaces. At this point, we're ready to make sure our brake hardware is properly installed and put these pads on.
of finagling, you should be able to get both brake pads into position. The next tricky part, however, though, is the anti-rattle grips, is they want to spread the brake pads and make them fall right off of there. To keep the brake pads from coming out, I'm going to get the caliper piston ready, and that means I have to apply some slide grease to the floating pin. I switched my mechanics gloves to some latex gloves so I can grease up these pins but minimize the spread of this grease getting on my brake assembly. This next step is super important. I need to push the caliper piston back in. Rather than push the dirty fluid from the bottom of this caliper all the way back up to the master cylinder, I'm going to open up my bleeder screw here. And I've got my brake bleeder bottle here. I'm going to expel the dirty fluid to my brake bleeder bottle. Of course, before I've push the caliper piston back in. What I've already done is examine the, boot, the dust boot here on the piston very carefully to make sure that there's no tears in this. If this boot was torn, I'd want to replace this caliper. If you do this right, you won't put any air in the brake system as you do this job. Always check your brake pedal feel before you go to drive your car. The one risk of opening up the hydraulic system is that you might end up having to do some brake bleeding later. In my opinion, this isn't a bad thing because you should change your brake fluid every few years anyways. Brake fluid is hydroscopic. That means it absorbs moisture from the air and it's designed to do that. But over time, the brake fluid becomes moisture loaded and so it needs to be changed out of there. So what that means is, is even if you had a car that really didn't drive too far, just the brake fluid sitting in the system would eventually cause it to absorb moisture and go bad. Now, if you look at the brake hose here, you might be able to see me expelling some of that dirty fluid out of the caliper. I used an old brake pad to press up against the caliper piston and keep it straight and a C-clamp to push in the piston. Looks like I pushed it all the way in. I'll take my C-clamp off. Take out my old brake pad. Again, dust boot looks good. Before I disconnect this hose, I'm going to tighten this bleeder screw. Don't go crazy tight on these bleeder screws. Just snug them up so they lightly seat. Have plenty of towels or rags handy so you can minimize your mess on this job. Remember that brake fluid eats paint pretty quickly and I don't want to get this on any painted surface. That's harder than it looks when you're doing it with one hand. With some finagling, you should be able to get both pads in place. But the tricky thing is, is getting these clips put in. What you have to do Keep the pads held on one hand while you do the clips with the other.
powder your caliper ready. Just slide in and over to keep everything held down. Again, we'll spray this down brake cleaner as we complete our final assembly. But I have one more brake pin I need to put in place. Thread the pin in by finger before you ratchet it down. Now you can see that my caliper can move back and forth as it floats on these pins. But I do need to torque down that bolt. Okay, so one last note on this assembly is that the pistons pushed all the way back in the caliper. I will have to pump my brake pedal several times to move the piston out to take up this clearance. Otherwise, when I go to drive out of, out of the shop here, I'm likely to crash into something because I will have no brake pedal until I get those pistons moved out. Okay, pump the brakes several times to move the caliper pistons out. What you'll find is probably after five to ten pumps, the pedal will start to get hard. If the pedal doesn't get hard, that's a sign that you need to go back through and bleed the brake system. One thing to note with these Hawk brake pads is the pad burnishing or brake in procedures. They want you to make several stops from approximately 30 to 35 miles an hour. Then they want you to make two to three more moderate stops from 40 to 45 miles an hour. And then they say increase your speed to simulate race conditions. At the end of that, they want you to let the brakes cool down. What this is doing is it's getting the brake pads up to temperature and it's allowing all the glues and compounds in the friction material to stabilize and then cool down before taking them out on the track for a hard, great, hard race procedure. When you put your wheels on, always start your lug nuts by hand. I'm going to zap these lug nuts down with my electric impact gun very lightly. Once I lower the car to the ground, I'll torque the wheels to specification using a torque wrench. Always go in a star or cross pattern to make sure you have stuff tightened evenly. 